Hi, my name is Jenny Kinn, and I am going to be presenting to you today a book. A book that's well loved by me. You can see I've 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 tabbed it up, I've marked it up. It's called uh, Mindfulness for Teachers: Simple Skills for Peace and Productivity in the Classroom. And the author is Patricia A. Jennings. I am excited to share my journey of mindfulness and um, the big findings, the big research findings from Patricia about mindfulness for teachers. So let's get started. Our book is called Mindfulness for Teachers, Simple Skills for Peace and Productivity in the Classroom by Patricia Jennings. Today, we will focus on chapter four, The Power of Positivity. Why are we having a mindfulness moment? Well, let me tell you about my journey and um, let me explain where, how it started. Well, about four years ago, I, I met Jen Clifton. You can see her picture there on the top left. She has a website called uh, Present Teacher. And she came out to Fernbrook where I currently teach. And she did a presentation on mindfulness. And the more I listened to her and her strategies and her practices, I kept having all kinds of connections. That's what I do. I do that. I didn't have a name for it. Oh, I do that. And, and she put this umbrella term over all of these practices that were so meaningful and powerful in my life uh, called mindfulness. So I took a class from her at Hamlin. That's the book you see next, the book that I've fallen in love with. And she taught the class and I took it a second time because I was just so hungry for the information. Then I started to recognize that some of the practices I've been using in my own home for my three children my children are pictured there, Jake, who's 21. He's a college student at UMD, currently at home, of course, with, with living with us since college is closed. Uh, my youngest, Emerson, he is 13, a student at Osseo Middle School. And then my daughter, Ellie, she's pictured there on the right. She's 19. She's not living at home. She's living in an apartment in Uptown. And um, I have been using these practices in my home. Uh, our daughter, Ellie, she struggles with some mental health concerns, and that has that could be a whole nother uh, study that we did together. But what I want to tell you about is that I grew as a person, as a parent, through this journey of mindfulness because I had a lot of struggles that I needed to overcome uh, in my home, being being the best mom that I could be. And as I got better at using these practices in in my house. I started to use some of them in my classroom and I thought I would use them mostly on students that, you know, were struggling with things or had hardships or some things to overcome. And then I started to recognize mindfulness is for everyone. Mindfulness is not just for people that are in the middle of a struggle. It's not for people that are having a really hard time. What I recognized is we all have struggles. We all have hard times. We all have hard moments. And so I started using mindfulness in my classroom with everyone, with myself at, at school. And um, so the more I started using it, the more I started talking about it with, with peers, with teachers, with other people that I know, uh, I got a couple nudges. That's what that little elephant is there. I'm the, I'm the little elephant. And my, my mentors gave me a little nudge that said, why don't you share some of your, um, your story with others? So here I am. I had a little nudge in my heart. Uh, my friends gave me a nudge. I had a little thing in my heart and then I heard a podcast and I'm going to share with you next the, how the podcast just made me decide that I'm here. I'm ready to talk to you guys. After hearing the podcast, I asked Ryan, Ryan, can I please present something to teachers on mindfulness? So let me hop back to that podcast. That podcast that I listened to talked about, uh, acronym of time and the T stands for treading. 
that's that's where I would say on my journey, treading meant that I was really struggling as a mom. I, when your kid is uh, struggling with some mental health things, anxiety, depression, uh, treatment, addiction, when you're in the middle of that, you are treading, treading water just to get through each day. And I started to implement the I, some mindfulness practices for myself and my family that really helped me get through the tough times. But then they, these practices have stuck with me, even though I wouldn't say I'm in the middle of crises after crises anymore. Um, these practices have stuck with me. So there, that's why I'm moving on into the M for mastery. I feel like I'm, I got this. I can do this a little bit here and there at my house. I, I got this. I can do this in my classroom a little bit. And I'm ready to share. That's the E, empower others. Let me give you the definition of mastery that I'm using, though, however. It doesn't mean that I've perfected my mindfulness. <laughs> far, far from it. It means that I am viewing mastery as a journey that I'm going down rather than a destination that I've arrived at. It starts, mindfulness is starting to feel achievable and attainable for me. So let me say I am not perfect. I get the app reminders that say, hey, you haven't visited us in a while. Hey, where have you been? We haven't heard you meditating with us for a while. I get all of those things. I lose my cool too. But what I have found is mindfulness has really helped me to be a better person and a better teacher. Let's start. We're going to do a personal check-in. Where are you today on the spectrum of mental health? I have two different representations. You use the one that's most meaningful to you. Do you like the artistic representation where the spectrum, the rainbow, shows that your mental health can be on the gloomier side or the sunnier side? Where do you fall on that spectrum today? Or do you prefer the heart emojis? Where is your mental health in reference to the heart emojis? Are you doing great? Are you doing pretty good? Are you doing okay, I guess? Are you starting to struggle? Are you having a really hard time? Or do you need to reach out for support? My goal is that mindfulness will help you. It's just a tool to help you move to a healthier level of mental health. It just is a little bit of a help. So hopefully after today's practices, you will feel that you have actually moved a little bit on your spectrum of mental health in a healthier direction. Let's get started. The first mindfulness practice that we're going to pick, that we're going to start with, is called setting an intention. Pick your word. Pick any word. You don't have to pick a word from my list. I'm just offering some words that were meaningful to me in the past. Uh, some words that have been sticking out to me currently that I added to this list. Pick a word. Hope, flow, trust, peace, gratitude, love, be, just be, alignment, or space. Those are just examples. You pick the word that's meaningful to you. It doesn't have to be on that list. Actually, two of my my own personal go-to words, one is, is strength on my necklace, strength, and the other one is be still on my wrist. Those are actually my go-tos, but lately I've been, like yesterday and today actually, trust. Trust has been my, my go-to word. I just need to trust more. Let go and trust. Got your word? All right, we're going to breathe in the word and then breathe out the word to the world. So breathe the word in for you and out for others. To do this, you breathe in through your nose and out through your mouth. I just made up this little heart that blooms. I call it a blooming heart. And I use my hands to do the breathing in for the heart and the leaves to breathe out. And I stop at the bottom by the dot with my hands. All right, let's do it. Breathing in through your nose. And out through your mouth. Breathing your word in. Breathing your word out. 
Breathing your word in. And out. Such a good way to start. Such a good way to start. Next, we're going to do a mini meditation. I like to use a headspace in school because it's a completely secular, uh, nothing spiritual. You'll never have to worry about any of their uh, meditations in school to have any spiritual aspect to them. They're just really um, great for a school setting. So let's start. Let's try it. Hi, and welcome to Headspace. So no matter what's going on in your life right now, no matter how many thoughts are racing around your mind, no matter how the body's feeling, just take a moment to sit down and take a big, deep breath, breathing in through the nose and out through the mouth. As you breathe in, a sense of taking in fresh air, the lungs expanding. As you breathe out, a sense of letting go of any stress in the body, in the mind, just feeling the muscles soften and relax. And close your eyes if you'd like to one more breathing deeply in through the nose and out through the mouth and just take a moment to pause allow the thoughts to come and go and then just gently opening the eyes again that's andy that's andy at Headspace. Whoops. Andy at Headspace is our favorite in my classroom. Headspace is free for teachers, free for ESPs, free for anyone who works in a school. So if you go to Heads, if you Google Headspace for Educators, it'll take you right to the link to sign up for free. I think it's about $60 if you are going to buy it um, as a non-school member. So it's a great deal. And uh, make sure you use your school email when you sign up. All right. The last meditation we're going to do is through a different school um, school safe meditation site called Mind Yeti. Uh, Mind Yeti is currently hibernating during quarantine. So right now their videos are on YouTube. So here is Mind Yeti. Mind Yeti. Our minds have different kinds of hubbubbles. Thoughts, feelings, and sensations. Our feeling hubbubbles are all the different emotions or feelings like sadness, happiness, or anger that we feel every day. Today, we'll take some time to notice our feeling hubbubbles. Before we begin, Take a moment to sit comfortably with your back straight and your feet or legs resting on the floor. Feel how the floor or your chair supports you as you sit. We call this your Yeti body. You can close your eyes if you want. Now take a deep breath in and let it go. We have many different feelings, changing day to day, or even from moment to moment. Some feelings are comfortable, and some are uncomfortable, but all feelings are okay. Now, we're going to practice noticing our feelings as they happen. Imagine you're playing a game with friends. You're trying really hard to win. And at first it looks like you just might. But in the end, 
you lose. Now, take a moment. How do you feel? Is it uncomfortable? Do you feel sad or disappointed? Okay, now return your attention to your breath. Take a slow breath in and out. Now, Imagine someone really special has come to see you. You open your door and there they are, smiling at you, so happy to see you. Take a moment and picture that in your mind. Notice how you feel. Do you notice a warm feeling? Okay, now return your attention to your breath. Take a slow breath in and out. Noticing our feelings helps us know ourselves better. It also helps us make better choices. Before you go, check in with your mind and body. What feelings do you notice? Take one more slow breath. When you're ready, open your eyes and bring your attention back to the room. Isn't that good? That's what we're working on today. Recognizing those comfortable and uncomfortable feelings today. So that is a perfect transition into our chapter. We're going to do just a quick review so we catch you up so in case you weren't at any of the other previous chapter trainings. I'll just do a couple, one or two slides on each and I'll go real fast. So what is mindfulness? The definition that we will work with throughout this uh, book and throughout this uh Staff development is a, a secular definition. It's science-based. Mindful, uh, mindfulness is awareness and acceptance of whatever is happening in the present moment. The here, the now, not the past, not the future. It's monitoring your real-time experience and, mon and responding non-judgmentally. Practicing mindfulness is an intentional act in which you pay attention and adjust your thinking or perspective. Why are we practicing mindfulness as teachers? Just as physical exercise builds strength, flexibility, and endurance in your body, mindful awareness practices build cognitive and emotional skills that cultivate inner strength, resilience, a sense of purpose, and the capacity for continuous learning and flexible adaptation in the face of change and life's challenges. How perfect for us. At home, and at school. Chapter two, we talked about the emotional art of teaching. We already know this, but thank you, Patricia Jennings, for giving us um, the research to tell us that at its core, teaching is an emotional practice. We all knew that, but there, now there's research. She went into the two categories of feelings, pleasant feelings or unpleasant or uncomfortable and comfortable. 
Patricia Jennings really wants us to know that feelings are not good or bad. Labeling a feeling as a good feeling and a bad feeling does not benefit us. It's much more beneficial if we can start to identify feelings as comfortable and uncomfortable because in reality, feelings are not bad. There are no bad feelings. Chapter three, we talked about those unpleasant emotions. The unpleasant or uncomfortable emotions that the research in teaching has been done on, on anger, fear, sadness, disgust, and contempt. It is very important to know that uncomfortable emotions are super important for survival. They help us to recognize when we have physical threats or psychological threats. In chapter three, we talked about our classroom setting and how that can provoke some negative emotions. I um, used a picture right here of my own classroom. If you can see Legos all over the floor in a ginormous, beautiful, ginormous, but beautiful mess. Um, sometimes when things are a mess, they can stir up some <laughs> uncomfortable feelings for me, uh, even if I can see beauty in it at the same time. The second thing layered upon chaos or something uh, uncomfortable happening in our classroom is our own scripts. Those are the things that have happened to us, the stories of our lives, the stories of us, the stories that make you who you are. Layer that on top of what's going on in your classroom and your body is primed for the stress response. That's that bear chasing us, that threat. Even though our classroom isn't actually a physical threat, we add our scripts onto it and we do perceive, our body perceives some of the experiences we have as psychological threats. Here we are, we're at chapter four. We're ready to begin chapter four, the power of positivity. Patricia Jennings gives us a beautiful definition of something positive called flow in our classrooms. I am going to read to you what she says about flow on page 83. As you watch my students there, they are in flow. I took this picture. I had 23 kindergartners all doing their math rotations. And let's see, you can see one, two, three, four groups. There's two more groups you can't even see in the picture. Four groups of kids all working really hard. Um, they're all in flow. So let me read to you what flow is. We've all had those miraculous moments in teaching when we're in sync with our students and things just flow. Moments when we're all in a groove, like a first rate jazz combo. The students are buzzing with interest and enthusiasm, merrily engaged in the learning activity that we worked hard to plan for. They're cooperating and learning the task. They're helping one another. They're asking complex and interesting questions. Creative and novel responses to problems are arising spontaneously and the thrill of learning is palpable. These are the most rewarding moments, the times when we remember why we became a teacher, those moments of flow. So the first activity I have for you is to think of a time when you experienced flow in your classroom. I wish we could actually exchange and I could hear your stories. <laughs> I would love to hear your stories. But think right now to yourself about a time that your class was in flow. Math rotations doesn't always look like flow, but this day and sometimes it does. And so I hope that you're able to um, think of something in your room. Next. Pleasant or comfortable emotions. Patricia Jennings identified 10 feelings. Joy, gratitude, serenity, interest, hope, pride, amusement, inspiration, awe, and love. Researchers have identified that these 10 comfortable feelings are experienced by the average person and that these are expressed using an authentic smile. 
I had a question occur to me, so I just popped it in here at the bottom. Why is the word happy not on this list of comfortable feelings? And I thought about that. This is something that just occurred to me as I was reading this. Why isn't happy one? And I am guessing, this isn't in the text, but I am guessing that all of these feelings, people could first identify as happy. These are all happy feelings. But then once you really start to zero in on what kind of happy you are, these 10 um, more clearly define what kind of happiness you're having. I don't know, just a thought. Here is that authentic smile. Unlike uncomfortable feelings, positive emotions do not have discrete biological signatures beyond one facial expression, the authentic smile. So if, for those of you that were with me in a previous chapter on negative feelings, we know that negative feelings give your body all kinds of physiological responses. Your heart rate, your skin might feel different. You might start to sweat. Your head might feel a certain way. Um, you might just start feeling jittery or a different temperature. You can feel all kinds of different physiological things from the negative emotions, but the one physical indicator of pleasant feelings is an authentic smile. You may notice your own body has different indicators for physical feelings, but there aren't those universal biological signatures. Um, some people do get that warm feeling like we heard about in the Yeti. Some people don't. But the authentic smile is something we all definitely have. Look at my little cutie sweetie pies from last year. Parent permission for the picture, of course. Twinning that day, super happy. <laughs> Pleasant or comfortable emotions can buffer the effects of uncomfortable emotions. That is so good to know. Research tells us that. Pleasant or comfortable emotions can broaden our awarenesses. Think of your five, sentence, five senses. Pleasant or comfortable emotions can broaden our visual attention. We are actually physically able to see the forest from the trees. You're actually able to see the bigger picture versus smaller details. Pleasant or comfortable feelings promote resilience and help people thrive. Pleasant or comfortable emotions increase your ability to attend to others, build more trust, have better bonds, increase your social opportunities, and reduce biases. Wow, we need to have a lot more comfortable feelings in classes, don't we? And lastly, pleasant or comfortable emotions improve our personal and professional well-being. Wow. Wow. We need to really work on these pleasant and comfortable emotions in our life, in our classrooms. Those are all such good things. Patricia Jennings gives us an activity to work on those comfortable feelings. And the activity is called noticing and savoring positivity. So that's basically just noticing good things happening in your life. <laughs> so I picked two good things. One is my one is something that just happened during virtual learning. Um, let me just define it and then I'll show you the things that happen. Comfortable emotions are easy to miss because they're subtle. How does your body feel when you're flooded with a pleasant emotion? Well, we just talked about that. Sometimes you have to really pay attention because the comfortable feelings are a little bit more subtle and harder to recognize than those uh, uncomfortable feelings. They're pretty obvious how your body's feeling. So I had a moment during virtual learning where I was reading a book to my class. It was actually um, April Fool's Day, and you can see my uh, little brownies on a plate there, brownies, where I was uh, teasing the kids I was going to give them brownies through the computer. And I could just hear them and see their faces enjoying that. That was savoring positivity for me. Uh, I read them a book, Happy Pig Day, where they have the pigs have a little celebration that everyone can do, just like April Fool's Day is for everyone. Um, and then we wrote together. We drew Piggy and we wrote, I could play a trick of my friend. And my kids were having, popping into the meeting with all of their things they could do to play a trick on a friend. It got a little chaotic, but um, we figured it out in kindergarten and we all got a turn to share. And it was just a really good day in um, kindergarten, virtually. Then I was thinking about another moment that I had at home 
it's kind of school related. So that's why I picked this, this story um, where I was enjoying being a mom of my little Emerson. He's 13 now, but this is when he was three. Uh, we were having a little homeschool moment when he was three and he was having so much fun learning that I started to record. So I savored the moment forever with my video. I'm going to share it with you. This is how Emerson does his homework. <laughs> Takes the caps off the markers. That's how he makes it fun. <laughs> Right? Is that making it fun for you? No. <laughs> it's not fun at all. It's horrible. Uh -huh. <laughs> what? Read me the word you just wrote. <laughs> What's the word you just wrote? <laughs> you don't know? <laughs> what? Um, oh, blue. Um, Wow. Blue. <laughs> Y'all can take a booger in the house. Stop it. Ew. I hope nobody else has to use these markers. <laughs> oh, God. And they won't even know that you've had them up your nostrils. <laughs> Trace. I'll outline the bow. Take your time. On the line. Stop! Why is video videoing this? Tell mom to stop videoing this. It's, it's done! <laughs> well, that was my Emerson. That was 10 years ago. Um, every time I watch it, even though I've watched it so many times, um, I just... I, I have this positive feeling inside me and I know it's so gross and as we're in quarantine we're being so careful about germs and I watch that video and I just I don't even know what I do with those marker caps or those markers but um that was 10 years ago so we're all good uh take a moment yourself to think about something that just helps you savor some positivity something in your classroom something at your house um Take a moment. That's one of Patricia Jennings' little um, skills to be mindful and save her positivity. All right, moving on. Emotions are experienced entirely in the present. The more mindful we are, the more we're able to notice and savor these moments. So noticing these Wonderful moments is being mindful. Let me turn to page 95 and read to you what she says. Like a castle that draws up the bridge and the bars and the doors close under siege. We go into survival mode and prepare to protect ourselves when we experience the uncomfortable emotions. We become wary and defensive. Our eyes scan the environment looking to identify trouble before it gets to us. Oppositely, we open up. We lift the grate. We put down the drawbridge when we have those comfortable feelings. Joy, gratitude, serenity, interest, hope, pride, amusement, inspiration, awe, and love. I love that little analogy, Patricia, about a castle. So our goal is to just soak in that positivity so that our drawbridge is down and our grate, that door is open. Patricia Jennings gives us a suggestion to um, learn th about these comfortable, how to produce these comfortable feelings in our classroom from mentors. And one of the mentors that she provides for us to um, listen to is this teacher. 
Maria. In the next few years, we don't know what the world is going to be like, and we want them to be strong. She said, to Mrs. Rifle, I, I don't know what to do with my life. And when I got them together, they both said they had tried to commit suicide. And they're fifth graders. Uh, for being as young as they are, that they're almost like some of them have given up on on life already. We have no idea. The majority of our children, the majority, have very important issues that they are dealing with. How many of you had breakfast this morning? You did not have breakfast. Please stand up. I mean, where are the parents? They sent. Uh, one teacher from every grade level to another school to just observe the school because they had higher test scores than us. And we just noticed that the school was so calm. So we said, what is it about your school? How did you get them to be like that? And she said, oh, it has to do with Mrs. Reifler. I choose. 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 I choose because when we were teaching adults, there was a big empty space in, in adults. She came into our classroom, you know, teaching the kids to like themselves and things like that. If you make good choices, you, you make good consequences. It's been a big deal. It's been a big positive change. It's just the tone. It's just her approach to everything. It's like, I want to be like that. <laughs> you know, when you think of Harvard and Yale and all those great universities, they need to have the person already made to go there to learn, to achieve just the goal, to be an attorney, to be a doctor. What kind of human being are you going to be? Oh, I have to work just to get the money so I can eat. Ah, oh, boring. <laughs> what kind of life is that, you think? Um, yes, um, not a good for my so you can have it really bad. Yeah, the consequences are bad. You have a bad day, you go home with a bad attitude. How are you going to treat your kids? Do you think they're going to treat their kids nicely? No, no really. So you see how important is what you're doing right now? When I grew up, I'd like to be an artist, forensic anthropologist, marine biologist, I want to be a filmmaker, doctor, an actor, play basketball, fashion designer. Unless we do something with education, with the total human being, we are not really preparing our children. That sense of security is so incredibly powerful for kids. Because so many of our children don't feel safe at home or in their neighborhoods. So to feel safe in school is so beautiful. You know, they won't be put down or hurt. This is my dream that we do this. Can you imagine if all the schools would feel this way? I want to be like her. <laughs> Isn't she inspirational? Uh, we learned that love is definitely a, her secret weapon. And we want love to be our secret weapon, too, in our classrooms. We're coming to the end. We have new mindfulness practices uh, to learn about that will help us look on the bright side, to see that positivity, to savor those comfortable things. The first one is a centering meditation. It's where you prepare your body to prepare your body to meditate. We're going to actually bring attention to your abdomen, which is about two and about two inches below and in from your belly button. I found Headspace has a perfect centering meditation. It's about a minute long um, that we can do with kids. And they can imagine they have a stuffed animal that they're actually placing on their abdomen to do this centering meditation.
Oh my goodness. I wasn't logged in. Sorry about that. Okay, I'm so sorry. I thought I had it prepped. The We're going to skip that one. Shoot. Well, Headspace has a great meditation that helps kids focus on that centering part in their abdomen. And they actually rest a invisible, is what I do in my classroom, uh, stuffed animal. If you had real stuffed animals, that'd be even better. But that's a whole other transition I don't choose to partake in. So you imagine a stuffed animal and the breathing exercises lift the stuffed animal and lower the stuffed ab animal for about a minute. Um, it's great. So. Too bad I can't show you. We will move on. Generating and savoring positively. positivity. This is where you think of a moment in your life, any moment in your life. This is not school related, although it could be, um, where you think of a positive moment that you've had. And when I was doing this practice for preparing for this um, presentation, one of the most recent activity uh, moments I had with my whole family, since I don't, like I told you, we don't all live together. So we don't always get to be together. And I just savor the moments we are together. So this was actually back in the fall. We were visiting my son, uh, Jake, up at UMD, where he goes to school or was going to school. And we we're out outside uh, Lake Superior on the beach. And my kids, we were all, we were getting along. There was not a problem. It, it was the sunset was beautiful. The beach was beautiful. The water was beautiful and everybody was happy. So I, as a mom, you can probably relate. This was just a wonderful moment. And so I was so thankful to capture the moment on camera. So nobody's wearing cute outfits. Gosh, my daughter just died that she, she knew that her picture with no makeup or anything was being posted for you all to see, but she's so happy. We're all so happy. And so I just think about this moment. And when I read the bottom there, when it says, think about who you were with, where were you? What was the weather like? What were the sounds and the smells? I kind of just described to you why that moment, like every bit of the moment was so wonderful that I, I honestly, I feel like I could go back to that moment and feel how it felt just by looking at that picture. You think about a moment that you have, that you have had and save for that moment. All right, the next activity that Patricia Jennings gives us is called a positivity journal. And I added the word gratitude because I think you've probably heard of that before, a gratitude journal. It's basically you write down things that are pleasant that you experienced today, where you notice and savor things in your life and notice that your life is full of blessings. So I, I don't get to journal every day. Remember, I'm not perfect. <laughs> I wish I journaled every day, but I do have a journal. And in my journal, I do have a little space where I write down some blessings of the day, uh, some little gratitudes that I've had. So it, not that I get to it every day, but I do try to. I would encourage you to. And the last one is called mindful walking. Another way to practice being in the moment is to focus your attention on your walking. Notice on the sensations you feel as you walk. If your mind waters, bring this attention back to your body. So the next time you're out in a walk in this beautiful springtime that's getting better every day, the next time you're out, I hope that maybe you'll try and bring this mindfulness into your walking and start to notice the things you're hearing, seeing, smelling, tasting, feeling, bringing in all of your five senses into your walk and just being mindful and present with yourself. If your worries come in, just let them go. If your to-do list comes in, let it go. Try and be present here and now on your mindful walk. I have included a whole bunch of just where I found all my pictures and references. And that's it. I hopefully, hopefully you'll join me for chapter five, which is next, the heart of teaching. Thank you for being with me. I'm trying to get back to my meeting. <laughs> Thank you for being with me today.
Thank you for being with me today. Again, my name is Jenny Knutson. I'm at Fernbrook. If you have any questions or want to email me, you sure can. I'm going to give you my email. It's Knutson, J K N U T S E N J at district279.org. Knutson J at district279.org. I'm a kindergarten teacher at Fernbrook. I am no expert, but I'm definitely on this journey with you in mindfulness. So if you have any questions or comments or wonderings or just want to send me a message, I would love to hear from you since we don't get to meet face to face. If you want to join me on chapter five, that will be my next recording. Talk to you later.